It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. 1 John 1 9 states, If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. There's a certain amount of academic discipline, actually a lot of academic discipline that goes along with learning the Word of God, and there's a lot more academic discipline that goes along with studying and teaching the Word of God. And uh, there's a joke I want to tell you that kind of deals with how most pastors deal with their duties and their academic discipline in terms of what they should do in terms of study and teach, study and teach, study and teach. There were once three boys and they were uh, bragging about their dads. And one boy stood up and said, uh, well, my father, he scribbles out a few words, calls it a poem, and he makes 50 bucks. Another one of the kids st stood up and looked at him and said, Oh, that's no big deal. My dad scribbles down a few words, calls it a song, and makes a hundred bucks. And the third boy stands up and says, My uh, father, he scribbles down a few words, and uh, he calls it a sermon, and it takes eight people to collect all the money. <laughs> now, that's the way it is today. Pastors scribbling down a few words make people feel good, collect money, and go home for the rest of the week. Now, it's not as if they don't do anything for the rest of the week. They visit people to make sure they keep on getting that money. Pat people on the back, visit people, visit people who haven't shown up in a while to encourage them to come back to his gobbledygook, etc. I find it all obnoxious. When a pastor studies and teaches, God provides the hearers, and if he doesn't, there aren't any. Period. But that's the way most people think of a pastor today, and it's true. And uh, there's something else about what people think about Satan as well. There were uh, two people walking home from Sunday school after they had just heard a rather serious message on Satan. And one of the boys asked the other boy, what, well, what do you think about Satan? And what do you think about uh, what you just heard? And he said, well, if, it has, if, it's, anything, if it's anywhere close to uh, what we heard about Santa Claus, Satan's probably your dad. <laughs> that is, that's the way most people think today when it comes to Satanology. They don't know much about Satan at all. But Satan is at work around the world, most definitely, and he has, uh, and he, as we've been noting, he is an enemy against the church. And he is an enemy in those places where there is definitely no divine establishment. Such a place as India, where I received this letter along with many others who uh, are interested in grace evangelic, evangelistic ministries. And uh, this letter says this, The Supreme Court in India has given police across the nation unlimited power to arrest and detain anyone who has been accused of talking to another person about Christianity. The report comes from the World Evangelical Alliance Religious Liberty Commission, which issued the alert on its news and analysis mailing list and assist news service. The WEA report by researcher Elizabeth Kendall said the ruling opens the door for policies with Hindu sympathies, that's the Hindu religion, to act as Hindu Taliban, meaning the Hindus, while they teach a religion of peace, they really do like to beat up Christians. Nuns, who cares about them, but nuns, pastors, 
bishops, we all care about them because they should have freedom to be idiots. Nuns, pastors, bishops, and evangelists, as well as Christian aid workers, teachers, and social workers, are all immediately at risk of arrest and imprisonment because of their Christian witness, Kendall's report said. As WorldNet Daily has reported, India is moving up on the list of nations around the world where Christians are persecuted. Why? It's very simple. There's obviously some positive volition there that Satan wants to squash. In fact, every Christian, actively witnessing or not, is at risk from hostile elements that may exploit the opportunity to bring false charges against them. Inspired by a variety of motives, in the same manner that the blasphemy law is exploited for personal gain in Pakistan. The technical ruling from India's Supreme Court was that police are not required to have warrants to file first issue reports and arrest and detain suspects, suspects something that won't happen here, at least not for a while. According to the Times of India, the ruling relieves police and prosecutors of the requirement of prior sanction from the federal or state governments or a local prosecutor. And uh, India is a large country and that means that any state can simply arrest someone for being a Christian. I won't go into much more of this because it has, it has a lot of details on law, etc. Indian law, that is law in India. And uh, it would be quite boring, but I will uh, read this last half. And sometimes Christians have a tendency to shoot themselves in the foot. Why? They go into Christian activism. And nobody likes an activist. Nobody likes telling people what to do. And uh, part of the reason, it is satanic, but sometimes Christians shoot themselves in the foot. Just let me read this last paragraph and you'll see why. During this month in our city of Vijayawada, when an anti-Christian film is being screened, almost 100 pastors and 5,000 Christians went on a silent procession, Christian activism, on the main roads protesting the release of the film The Da Vinci Code. Big deal. You see, there should be pastor study and teaching, but they don't know any better because all of the evangelism they have ever received has come from the United States and all the evangelists and missionaries, most of which, most evangelists and missionaries that have come to the, from the United States and have went to India have taught those Christians how to do what? Be activists. Not how to live their spiritual life. So they're going around being activists. And in fact, in being an activist, they're acting no different than the Hindi or the Muslim. So they want to stop this film, The Da Vinci Code, which is stupid. If an idiot wants to watch The Da Vinci Code, they should have the freedom to watch it. But Christians even lose sight of that because they get into activism, which is also part of Satan's system. And when you get into activism, sometimes the persecution that comes is well-deserved. But anyway, they went out to uh, protest The Da Vinci Code. And uh, when they went to a theater to request the authorities to stop screening the film, you see, we have free enterprise. If somebody makes a film, an idiot wants to watch it, they can pay for it. So the police came and did what? Detained all the pastors and evangelists. In this case, they should have. But at any rate, they don't know any better. And now, they'll just arrest any Christian, no matter what. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're activists or not. And they get neighbors in on it and they peer through windows and say, are they having a Christian meeting? Oh, yes, they are. Let's call the authorities. Maybe we'll, we will get a reward. But that's part of the satanic policy. And he has a specific policy called evil. Satan has a specific policy called evil. Point one, this was first seen in the Garden of Eden when in the middle of the Garden of Eden was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All of that represented the composites of Satan. So point one, this was first seen in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Point two, human good is the application of evil. What's human good? Trying to keep people from watching the Da Vinci Code could be used or viewed as human good. It's worthless. It means nothing. 
You're fighting a symptom. The root cause is this. Who are you going to save by protest? No one. How do you evangelize? Not by protest. You evangelize. Usually, uh, the greatest evangelism comes one-on-one, -on -one, from believer to unbeliever. And in fact, there have, uh, I know, in fact, there have been more people saved from one believer to one unbeliever than ever has in an evangelistic meeting, including the large meetings of Billy Graham. One-on-one, -on -one, where a believer who knows the gospel gives it correctly to an unbeliever. And there have been way more saved in that one-on-one -on -one evangelism than ever from the gift of evangelism because those with the gift of evangelism have failed in every way. They have not, they don't even know the gospel themselves, barely. And as a result, it takes an awful lot of work from the Holy Spirit to make it clear. So human good is the application of evil. Turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy 3.13. Which, which, talk, which talks about evil. And Satan has a specific policy called evil, and there are evil men who follow his policy. And Satan is on the attack. And if you wonder why, I know why. The greatest teacher since the Apostle Paul has stopped teaching. Now maybe he has a chance, he thinks. Now maybe... No one will fill in the gap. Who can fill such big shoes? No one. That is Colonel Thiem I'm talking about. And ever since uh, he has stopped teaching, the world has gone nuts. All you have to do is watch television. And if you think there's no correlation, you're an idiot. Some people have no respect for Colonel Thiem, and they're idiots. Well, they either, they either have never heard him, or they just uh, fall into Satan's system. And boy, do you, do you understand Satan hated and still hates the ministry, R.B. Theme Jr. Ministries. I guarantee he hates it with a, a vehement hatred. And now since uh, a lot of people are falling away from that, he thinks it's his opportunity. So in 2 Timothy 3.13 it says, When evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse. They get involved in evil and they start out bad and they even get worse. Deceiving and being deceived. Look at your composite sheet. What does your composite sheet say about Satan? The composites of Satan include deception. And when a person moves into evil, he's moving into Satan's system. He's being deceived by Satan and at the same time he's deceiving. And that's how you get involved in his system. Of course through sin and then as you stay in sin and move into Cosmic 2 you go from bad to worse. You go from Cosmic 1 bad to Cosmic 2 worse. So all reversionists have been deceived by Satan to the extent that they are influenced by both human good and evil. So the pastor, therefore, is to take disciplinary action toward those opposed to doctrinal teaching. That means toward those who try to muzzle the ox, shut up the pastor, or those who try to throw out certain people on their own accord, and those who keep certain people from coming to church on their own accord. We studied that in 3 John and also those who say you can only teach this long you can't teach any longer this is how long you teach period those are those who muzzle the ox who muzzle the pastor imagine anyone telling that to Paul Paul just kept on talking they started beating him and he kept on talking he didn't care so the pastor is to take disciplinary action toward those opposed to doctrinal teaching why? so that they will recover from their reversionism and be delivered from the devil's trap. If not, they're on a road toward the sin face to face with death. If you ever get a hold of Schaefer's Systematic Theology, Volume 2, pages 100, or actually uh, pages 108 through pages 100 and pages 108 through 110, give a fantastic description of Satan's policy and Satan's system of evil. 
And in fact, uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer talks about he tries to incorporate all the good in this world, and yet it's all human good and all evil. I don't have the quote here for you now, but uh, I'm sure a few of you listening may have Schaefer's Systematic Theology. Again, it's in Volume 2, page 100, 108 through 110 as well, and it's a fantastic description of Satan's system of evil. Now, Satan has a strategy regarding the cross, of course. That was his biggest uh, thorn in the flesh and still is. Satan's greatest strategy is the doctrinal attack on the cross and on the principle of faith alone in Christ alone. That's why so many people are running around inviting Christ into their heart and think it's absolutely correct to do so. Where do they get this nonsense? Not from the Bible, but from the false doctrines of Satan. So if our gospel is hidden, it is hidden to them who are lost, that the God of this world, Satan, might blind the minds of those who do not believe. This attack is accomplished by adding various types of works to salvation, such as making Christ Lord, addition by whom? Satan. Walking an aisle, addition by whom? Satan. Raising your hand, addition by Satan. Inviting Christ into your heart. Addition by Satan. In this way, Satan has been able to obscure salvation. And the issue is not clear that it's faith alone and Christ alone because Satan has clouded the way. And very few people have ever heard it. And some people, when you tell them it's faith alone and Christ alone, they will say to you, No, I have to feel something. And they're wrong. The Bible is what we go by, and the Bible says believe in the Lord. Excuse me, believe, I have a, a sinus running problem. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son, so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. Believe, believe, not invite. By the way, there, there will only be... Uh, one message tonight. It's Friday, and uh, I might go fishing tomorrow. So we have the genetic attack on the line of Christ. First of all, through Adam's seed. First of all, through Adam's seed. So write that down so I can swallow. Through Adam's seed. Again, the genetic attack on the line of Christ. It has come in many different categories. Through Adam's seed <clears throat> is number one. Now, the attack through Adam's seed occurred this way. After the original sin of Adam and the woman, God came into the Garden of Eden and he promised eternal salvation. Adam was at that point promised that the line of Christ would come through the children of Adam and Eve. And of course, that's true. Satan inspired Cain to murder Abel. That was a satanic attack. Why did Satan inspire Cain to murder Abel? It was his intention to block the line of Christ. So Satan inspired Cain to murder Abel, who was a believer. And he did so because he thought, well, if he could get everyone to start killing each other, he could keep the Savior from coming into the world. Well, that's pretty super genius thought right there. Get everybody to go into violence, everybody kills each other, and Jesus Christ will not come into the world. But that satanic thought, in the same way that you think that you can destroy this world through your environmental uh, mishaps, whatever you want to call it, because you drive a car to work, that's what Al Gore thinks. If you drive your car, he thinks the automobile, according to his book, I'm, I'm, I'm not making anything up, according to Al Gore's book, he believes the automobile is the greatest danger to the human race. The combustible engine, not just the automobile, the combustible engine, is the greatest threat to the human race. According to our former vice president, even before he became vice president, he thought that. And people elected him. Satan system. But that's what he said. And this is what he thinks. 
And uh, the fact is, Jesus Christ keeps the world turning, and no matter how hard Satan tries to stop it from turning, it's not. The earth will be here if the resurrection occurred tonight, which would be nice, but if it didn't, it may happen a million years from now. We just do not know. Some people might say, oh, nah, it won't be a million years. You might be right because the, the more numbers you add on to it, the less chance. I mean, that's mathematics. If I were to say a trillion years, you'd say, oh, it really won't happen a trillion years from now. The fact is still, it could. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the mathematic probabilities, but uh, the only thing we can say is that today we are one day closer to the rapture than we were yesterday. That's all you can say about it. I remember one time having uh, supper with some idiots, and uh, well, they were all predicting the resurrection is going to occur in this generation. It may or it may not. I don't know. And they didn't know either, but they thought they knew. And uh, one guy thought he was real smart, and he said, "We're one day closer to the rapture." And he looked at me eyeball to eyeball. And uh, hey, how can you disagree with that? Yeah, we're one day closer, but it doesn't mean we're the rapture generation. Some people are so, so slow. I won't say retarded anymore. Yes, I will. Satan inspired Cain to murder Abel, who was a believer. And, uh, and that is to keep the Savior from coming into the world. Seth also became a believer. So the line of Christ comes down through Seth. Seth, by the way, is Semitic. But when we deal with Seth, uh, he's not a Jew. Seth is not a Jew. This is before Abraham. But Seth is a Semitic race. The Arabs, by the way, are Semitic. I'm anti-Arab, so I guess you could say I'm anti-Semitic, but not really. Because anti-Semitism refers only to the Jew. Now, I'm not anti-Arab, as it were. And I'm talking in general in terms of the fact that we're at war with them. When you're in, when, and when you're at war, you have your enemy. Now... Uh, I'm sure there are some wonderful Arab believers, very few, but I'm sure there are a few wonderful Arab believers. So it's not a matter of race, it's a matter of your choice. It just so happens that a majority of that race is anti-Semitic toward the Jew. So the line of Christ comes down through Seth, which happens to me a Semitic line. Genesis 6, 1 through 3 tells of the angelic attack through sexual intercourse. Now this is a genetic attack on the line of Christ. Genesis 6, 1 through 3 tells of the angelic attack through sexual intercourse to destroy the humanity that was on the earth. That is, embodied demons, you all know this story of the Nephilim. Embodied demons came down, had sex with the, all the women who uh, fell all over themselves to have sex with these beautiful demons. They did, and as a result they had half human, half demon Creatures, not humans. They were not human. They were creatures. Half demon and half human creatures. And they are called the Nephilim. And these Nephilim uh, actually started a lot of violence around the world, etc. But they are the heroes of old that you read about in Greek mythology. So there were only eight human beings on the earth in which... Uh, the uh, line of Christ actually was preserved and came down through. Uh, it was uh, four marriages, eight human beings, and that's it. Now through Adam's seed, God promised that the line of salvation would come down through the child of Abraham. Abraham's seed, I didn't mean to say Adam. Through Abraham's seed, God promised that through Abraham's seed, salvation would come down through the child of Abraham. This is the Abrahamic covenant. And Abraham, by the way, is the first Jew. I had a wonderful history teacher in 10th grade, but he, he got this one wrong. He asked, uh, who was the first Jew? I said, was it Abraham, of course. He said, no, the father of the uh, Jewish race is uh, Jacob, who later became Israel. He was associ associating Israel the name Israel with Israel with the father of the Jewish race. Abraham is the father of the Jewish race. When Abraham became a new racial species, he did so at the age of 99. Until the age of 99, he was a Gentile. At the age of 99, when he 
circumcised himself, he became a Jew. Sexual ability was then restored to Abraham and Sarah, and the line of Christ came down through Abraham and Sarah. Old people now, 99 and 90. And a 90-year-old woman gave birth to Isaac. Isaac gave birth to Jacob. And Jacob gave birth to Judah. You're going to have to bear with me. The pollen levels are higher. I heard it on the news. The pollen levels are higher at this time of year. And I can tell. So there were uh, the Abrahamic attack and on the attack of the line of Abraham. And there were several attacks on the line of Abraham. And Sarah, by the way, had to be delivered from the uh, harem of the Egyptian king. You will all remember that story. And if you don't remember it, we will study it very soon. And uh, she was actually rescued from the Egyptian king, and that would have ruined any chance of the line of Christ, all of which was a satanic ploy. Pharaoh's mandate to kill the firstborn children was attack on the line of Christ. We noted that when we studied that in Exodus. That's an attack on the line of Christ. And he did this in Exodus 14, 13. We've studied that. There was also a satanic attack through David's seed. A satanic attack through David's seed. So now we'll look at David's seed. Number one, now this I'll go quickly through, and uh, I don't have time to tell you all the stories involved in this, but number one, there's the case of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat had a son called uh, Jehoram, and he married... He was married off to a princess of a Gentile nation in order to make an alliance. And that's found in 2 Chronicles 18.1. Jehoram uh, was married off to make an alliance with a Gentile nation. Jehoram killed all of his brothers. He killed all of his brothers, the royal seed. The Arabs killed all the sons of Jehoram except one. One. The Arabs killed all of the sons of Jehoram. You see, Jehoram killed all his brothers. So that knocks out the line of Christ in that way. So that means Jehoram is the only one left in the line of Christ. So then the Arabs come along and kill all the sons of Jehoram except one. This means that the line of Christ went down all the way to one during the time of David's seed. Just one. So the line was down to one person through whom Christ could come. That was satanic attack. There was one left and God knew it. Satan's not all that smart. We also have the case of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was childless when he was attacked by the king of Assyria. And we remember in our study of Hezekiah, he was about to die the sin unto death before. The sin face to face with death actually before he uh, this was he was to die the sin face to face with death before he ever had a son that's found in Isaiah 36 1 and God preserved him until he was till a son was born to him and in fact Hezekiah rebounded and then a son was born to him so again it was down to one person. One of the greatest attacks on the line of Christ occurred during the Haman conspiracy. All of you should know the Haman, Haman, Haman conspiracy. If you've studied Bobby and the uh, series of Esther, you know it. The Haman, Haman, however you want to pronounce it, it's probably Haman in their language, but we would say in our very beautiful southern dialect, Haman. So one of the greatest attacks was the Haman conspiracy in which he uh, went out to annihilate all the Jews and he did so in the book of Esther. <laughs> but God turned it around to where Haman was the man who was killed. A very phenomenal poetic book. Very poetic in terms of its poetic justice. And even though the name God is never mentioned in the book of Esther, you can see the imprint of God's hand all through the book of Esther because it's pro-Semitic. And any book that is pro-Semitic 
I guarantee you it's canonical. And there's a big, what I mean by that, is there's a big uh, idea, well maybe Esther's not even supposed to be part of the Bible because God is never mentioned. The very fact that it's pro-Semitic means it's canonical. It means it's right. It means it's from God. And just because God is not mentioned doesn't mean his doctrines are not mentioned all through the book of Esther. And what doctrine is that? Those who curse the Jew will be cursed. Those who bless the Jew will be blessed. That's what the book of Esther is all about. And then through Joseph's seed. Joseph, that is Joseph and Mary, Joseph was, attempt, was tempted to divorce Mary. And that was a normal temptation because he found out she was pregnant prior to the fact that they had ever had sex. And uh, Joseph said, we've never had sex. How are you pregnant? And so he decided as a very uh, a man of virtue, he decided, well, I'll just put my wife away. And I won't have her killed, but I'll just uh, put her away silently. But anyway, that was an attack because Joseph was tempted to divorce Mary because she was present, pregnant prior to the consummation of marriage. Then after that, Herod sent a command to kill the royal line of Israel. And we note that, and that is when Joseph and Mary had to make a run down to Egypt. So Satan was always trying to attack the line of Christ. We remember from last night that Satan was actually watching at the birth of Christ and was eager right then to kill him. But of course, if he did so, he would be out of order in the court, with in contempt of court. You're in contempt of court, trying to kill a witness, trying to kill the star witness before he's even had a chance to give his testimony. Therefore, you are out of line in contempt of court. And if Satan had tried anything, he would have been thrown into Sheol along with uh, the embodied demons. But he, would, he was a little bit smarter than them, and he said, I won't try anything. I'll wait till he's old, older, and then I will attack him during his most vulnerable time while he's starving, etc. So there are doctrinal attacks on the cross as well. Doctrinal attacks on the cross... That is false doctrine. Doctrinal attacks on the cross. False doctrine. First, limited atonement. Limited atonement is a great doctrinal attack upon the cross. Limited atonement says... Well, it's part of hyper-Calvinism. And it says uh, basically this. All of you stand up. Number one, step forward. You're saved. Number two, unsaved. Number three, step forward. You're saved. Number four, unsaved. Number five, saved. Number six, unsaved. And it's as if God arbitrarily picked who would be elect and who would not. And it is as if God arbitrarily... It is as if Jesus Christ arbitrarily died on the cross only for the sins of the elect. Incorrect. A false doctrine. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the godly, the believers, and the ungodly, the unbelievers. Both. Jesus Christ died on the cross for everyone. Everyone. Believer or unbeliever. So that's a doctrinal attack on it. There is also the uh, second erroneous idea and that is the idea that Christ bled to death on the cross. And that's an erroneous idea. He did not bleed to death. In fact, he decided when he would depart from the earth when he said, Father, into thy hands I dismiss my spirit. And before he said that, what did he say? Tetelestai, it's finished. Now, if he had bled to death, he wouldn't be able to do any of that. He died spiritually on the cross for us, not physically. Physical death was involved, but he died spiritually for us on the cross. That is where we get our salvation. 
And yet uh, people attack that like crazy. They say, oh, it's in the blood. It's in the blood of Christ. And if you talk against the blood of Christ, then uh, uh, you are a blasphemer. And they don't even know what they're saying. And then a tornado comes and sucks up their church. No, I'm talking about I'm talking about something from uh, uh, listening to others talking from personal experience. But they go from the, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is a metaphor. There are metaphors in the Bible. There's symbolism in the Bible. So the blood of Christ is a metaphor for redemption. It's not the literal blood. Jesus Christ did not bleed to death on the cross. What a stupid thing. They don't know the Bible. That's what it is. And the metaphor refers to things of theology, things pastors do not understand today. Most pastors. What things of theology? Basic things like reconciliation, propitiation, imputation, unlimited atonement, justification. So the state satanic strategy is to confuse people into believing that Jesus Christ died physically rather than spiritually as a substitute for our sins. That is the greatest flaw in Mel Gibson's movie. Otherwise excellent, using Aramaic and everything else. Well, when you use the original language and you're going from the original language, it's perfect. But the way it was portrayed was that Jesus Christ died physically for us. It wasn't, we didn't see any type of spiritual death. It wasn't explained. Well, Mel Gibson wouldn't be able to explain something spiritual like that. But it was all physical, all focused on the physical. And uh, if you knew anything about the Bible, you would see where he said, Tetelestai, it's finished. And you would see where he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And you would see all of that, and you would understand it. But in terms of the average moviegoer, they all came out of there. Jesus Christ suffered so horribly physically for me. And he was on the cross bleeding and dying for me. But they're thinking in terms of physical death. That's not to mean that they people weren't even... People were probably saved watching that movie. I'm, I'm sure lots were. Probably many people, more than we know. But, as believers, they're now confused as to whether... Was it a physical death? Or was it a spiritual death? Oftentimes when we believe in Christ, we just say, well, I believe in Christ and I believe it. And uh, you're saved when you believe. doesn't matter if it's a grain of uh, a mustard seed, what they call it. A mustard seed. doesn't matter if it's that small. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you're saved. And uh, But as a believer, you need to begin to understand what it was all about. And he died physically. He did not die physically. He did die physically, but not as a substitute for us. He died spiritually as a substitute for us. And he did not bleed to death on the cross. That's a doctrinal attack. And some people would throw eggs at me if they heard that. They would get very angry. It's unbelievable. Well, they don't know any doctrine. Satan also has a strategy regarding Israel. But I think I'll hold off on that until our double session on Sunday. I just don't feel like talking anymore. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. May we come to understand Satan and his plots and his plans and his deception so we can follow the protocol plan of God. We ask these things in the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.